you have your Bibles, open them to uh, Matthew 22. We're going to be looking at two scriptures, one in Matthew 22 and one in Matthew 28. I am very eager to hear what comes out of my mouth today. <laughs> Amen. I, <laughs> usually I know what's going to come out of my mouth. Well, I shouldn't say usually. Sometimes I haven't got a clue. But uh, usually when I preach, I know what's going to come out of my mouth. But um, we're starting... Uh, 2020 off um, with purpose. We're starting 2020 uh, to, um, and I'll explain why in, in just a second, but um, we studied in Sunday school this morning about uh, walking by faith, but there are sometimes you don't need to walk by faith, you just need to take a giant leap of faith. And uh, this year, and in the months that are ahead, um, just about everything I'm going to be doing is going to be a leap of faith. Just jumping off the edge of the cliff and praying that God catches. Amen? So um, instead of having you stand and read scripture, we're going to just try to tell the story of where we'll be going in the next few months and why we'll be going there. So let me pray and uh, add God's blessing to what we'll be uh, talking about here today. Y'all ready? Let's pray. Father, we uh, love you. You are high and lifted up. You sit enthroned um, in heaven. There are, you are so loved, and it is expressed even in that moment there, but, Father, it's also expressed here. We are your people. We don't come to church. We are your church. 24-7, 365, and all the different addresses, all the places that we live and we work and we play, we are your church, and Lord, we want to be about your business. So Father, uh, help us as we begin this walk of faith, or Father, as we take this giant leap of faith, and I pray that uh, you will catch us, or we'll have the most glorious splat in your name. But, Father, for your glory and for your glory alone. But, Father, may your will be done and only your will be done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, let me kind of tell you the, the beginning of, of um, what we're going to be talking about today. Last summer, Broadus came and we were looking at the church constitution. There were some changes that were going to be made and brought before the church, and it would be presented to the church in and, uh, and one conference, and then it would be uh, addressed the next conference. And we did that um, the beginning of the summer, the end of the summer. And I began to look, uh, I'd only been your pastor for a few months, and I began to look at that document the, where the, uh, the bylaws of the church are and the church's constitution. Uh, basically, why you do what you do. And in that statement, there was a, a mission statement. And uh, actually, in my, my office, uh, there was a copy of the old mission statement on the wall that had been redone. Uh, I don't know who all did it, but there was definitely some time and effort that was taken involved into to reviewing that and, and saying, this is what we as a church at New Holland are going to do. So... I made a commitment then. I was going to leave my office just the way it was for a year. Haven't changed a thing. Uh, I wanted just to, to, to soak it in, so to speak. Um, by the way, that's coming up to an, a change in March, and one of the first things I'm going to do is change the decor of my office. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but if you, make a, if you make a commitment to the Lord, you keep it. So uh, then I came in last Sunday, and y'all may rem or last summer, and I asked the question to the church. I said, how many of you know the mission statement of the church? 
And then we got some of this. But mostly we got. <laughs> so um, Mark uh, put it up on screen. And when you come into the church and you're looking through the, the slides, it's one of the slides that will come up here. And I noticed that after that, I didn't say anything else, but uh, Broadus, actually, we were uh, meeting, and he quoted it. He had gotten it, and uh, I don't know, did you already know it by heart, or did you just go, about, go out to, to memorize it by heart? He knew parts of it, but he can quote that thing now. And, and really, um, that's really what I was trying to say is um, we need to take it off of the shelf and start living it. Well, in that time frame, uh, some of the pastors in our association, I'd ask a question to uh, our associational missionary, Jojo Thomas, that I've known Jojo for close to 30 years. Um, I asked him about education in church and Sunday school and small groups and how, how we could most maximize our effort. And here at New Holland, uh, we were talking about facilities and, and what we're going to do. And I wanted to know how to best maximize our facilities. And I'd actually gone through and looked at all the rooms that we have and all the stuff that we put in all the rooms that we have. And I was trying to figure out what kind of a number we could actually put in in small groups of people studying the Word of God and, and discussing the Word of God together. And by the way, I came up with, uh, if we're creative, we could probably put 200 people in small groups with the facilities that we have. And to that, amen? amen. We had 101 on campus this morning, by the way. Uh, so all I'm asking you to do is double. Anybody good for that? But... Hey Amen. We had 161 totally being taught because some of our people were off campus this morning teaching the Word of God too, and we praise God for that work as well. 161 total, but 101 on campus. So I was asked to be a part of this group that was going to talk about how churches today uh, are, are seeking to um, do church and how they're seeking to disciple, how they're seeking to do Sunday school, small groups, whatever you want to call it, how, how they're doing what they're doing. So I agreed, and I began meeting with them, and, and one of the questions that they asked was, um, what is the values that your church has, and how is it seeking to live out those values? And, and really what they were saying was, what are you wanting to do? And it was kind of an exploratory thing. And I'm like, hold on. And they, they wanted us to come together the month later and tell them what we were going to do in changing our... I'm like, hold on, time out, time out. We're, we're not going to change the value. Um, uh, that's not my job. As a matter of fact, we already had it stated in your mission statement, and, and I believe it explains the core values of New Holland very well. So I, I let them know, and, and I'm letting you know, I, I don't have a desire to change anything. Amen? But I do have a desire for us to get it off the books and into our heart and into, let, let's get into living it. If we say it's valuable, if we say that it's important, then let's look at it, let's discuss it, and, and we're going to do it in big ways. For the next five weeks, we're going to talk about the five core values, and I'm going to begin a message on each one of those five core values, but it's not going to stop there. Because that's normally what happens, is we're going to say, this is what we think is important. This is, and, and I don't know how many hours it took and all the people that were involved. I don't know those things to create such a powerful document and to make that mission statement. I know that it came before the church. And I know that it was discussed in front of the church. And I know that it was voted on, and I have a sneaking suspicion, it was voted on 100%. Don't know that, but I don't know who in the world would stand up and say, I don't agree with this, because it's biblical. Matter of fact, um, let's, let me read to you the, the mission statement that we have right now. And I thought about putting it up on slides. I thought about putting most of what I was going to put up today on slides. 
but I really, instead of giving you this great big pastoral message, I, I want us just to kind of have a talk. Is that fair? Let's just share. So this is what the statement says. The purpose of New Holland Baptist Church is to glorify God by making disciples of local residents and the nations of the world through worship, evangelism, teaching, preaching, and ministries of loving service. And all God's people said? Amen. I mean, who would not agree with such a statement? But let's kind of define what those statements are. Well, hold on. Let, let's, let's not get into the define. Let's talk about how they are biblically put together. If you have your Bible in Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verse 37. Well, let me, let me get a running start in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, that is, Jesus, had answered their questions, and they didn't know what to say or ask, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And really, they were trying to find a way that they could argue with Jesus, trip him up in some way. So whatever his answer was going to be, they, they were going to try to pick it apart. Sounds kind of like our government today, doesn't it? But it said in verse 37, Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. That's Deuteronomy chapter number 6. It's called the Shema. It means the word Shema means to listen. So New Holland, let me ask you once again to listen, not only with your ears, but listen with your heart. This is the duty for all of us. It begins with this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. In Mark's account of this, he also adds the word, and with all your strength, literally with all your passion, with all that you have within you. And that is Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. Now, to love the Lord with all of our heart. He's the God of the universe. He created us all. We can't take a next breath without him. He sustains us. Our heart does not beat unless he allows it. We've been given this thing called life. Should we not offer back to him our best? All God's people said? Amen. By the way, if you don't amen, I'm going to ask you to amen. And that was a good place to do it. He's a good God. We're going to spend eternity with him. Or we're going to spend eternity separated from him. Your choice, my choice. I choose him. I want to be there with our great God. And in this world, let's get, let's fall in love. Amen. I met my wife in church. I was minding my own business. I was, it was visiting church. I was sitting back there, about where Jason is. And, and, and there was this beautiful creature singing in the choir. And I don't know what they sang. I don't know much of what the preacher preached on that day. But uh, I heard the tuning fork in my heart. Can I get an amen? amen? And I made up my mind. And over the next months, um, I set my mind on that. I had to chase her down, by the way. Chased her through the church parking lot one time. <laughs> You'll do what your heart tells you to do, right? And when we started to date, we got to know each other, but we spent time together. And for the last 32 years, she has been my bride. And I love her. And can I say I do love her with all my heart? But can I tell you that as we go through the mountain peaks and also go through the valleys, we learn each other, and it's a miracle that she still likes me. But yet I've grown to love her more and more and more. And people talk about why they need to come to church. Because this is where God's people meet together. I didn't invent church, he did. But I'm around people who are in love with the same Lord that I am. And I'll tell you that there are times that you encourage my heart. And I pray that there are times that I will encourage your heart. 
There are times that your, your prayers and how you represent your heart to God thrills my soul. And there are times when the choir will sing or a soloist will sing or someone will, will be fellowshipping together in the aisles and, and will just say, what a great God we have that has made us one. And, and we want to love him more. I've been a Christian for 47 years and I haven't reached that place of, of putting the period to the end of the sentence. I, I got sentence run on. I just want to keep talking about how much I love my God. And I want to walk with Him every day through all the different aspects of the day. And my goodness, this past week has been one of those weeks. And yet I can stand before you today and say, I love Jesus. But He says there's something that goes with that. He says, this is the first and great commandment, to love the Lord our God. And the second is like it. It's similar. It's compounded. It adds to. It's not just one, but if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then there's something that, that flows from that. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself and if we want to talk about who your neighbor is y'all do this for me and you in the balcony I'll look up there at you too and by the way loving your neighbor as much as you love yourself I've always said that's loving them quite a bit we love ourselves a lot don't we oh you should have said amen to that So we love God, amen? amen? But we also love others. When I was a young kid, y'all know what that meant? Now, hold on. For some of you that are older than me, that meant, this meant victory. Like when you're coming back from World War II, my dad did that, and they said victory. But I, I grew up in the, in the 70s, and when we said this, we said what? Peace. Peace. If you take those two fingers and you put them together, Loving God and loving others. I think that means peace with God and peace with others. So let's just put them together and love God and love each other. Is that not good? Take your Bible and turn to Matthew 28. You'll know this is the great commission. The great commandment is to love God and love others. But the great commission is in Matthew 28. Let's get the running start and look in verse 16 because there's a, a word that I want you all to get. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, that is Jesus, they worshipped him. That's a good phrase right there. The word means to bow down and honor and awe and respect for who Jesus is. Literally for what he had done for the scars that he bore, and now for the enlightenment of what that meant. The one who was definitely the God of not just life, but eternal life. But look what it says there in verse 17. When he saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I love how the word of God just shows us the honesty of the moment. Have anybody in here ever doubted after you became a Christian? Raise your hand. We're not always there, are we? But we're grateful that Christ is here. So in that moment, before he is about to raise his hands and ascend to glory, Acts chapter 1, he gives a command to them. Verse 18, all authority has been given to me. All authority, all means all, and that's all all means. All authority, power. There's only one God, and it is Him. And because He is God, we worship Him. We serve Him. We follow Him. God doesn't come and say, uh, Rick, if it's okay with you, I, this is what we need to do. 
We come to God and say, God, because you are you, this is what we're going to do, right? We don't come to tell God. We have made up our mind when we accepted him as our Lord and Savior that he is God and we are not. He doesn't need our advice, but we need him for every breath. So when he says all authority has been given to him, let's not be in battle with that. Church, let's just begin this next few months' walk saying and believing and experience that he is God and we'll do whatever he asks us to do. Come on. He is God, and let's just make up our mind that if God asks us, we will do whatever he asks us to do. Amen? Go, therefore. Go, therefore. Make disciples of all nations. Go. Go. Make disciples. That is evangelism. How are they going to know unless somebody tells them? You just don't wake up and you're a Christian. By the way, you're not born a Christian. You're born a sinful. You have a sinful nature. The term is you are totally depraved. There's nothing you can do to get to heaven on your own. You need a holy God. You need what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary. You need to accept the gift of God into your life. You can call it whatever you want to call it, but it's evangelism. And we are to love God, we're to love others, and the church must be about the business of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel with others, so that they can know Christ like we do, so that they can be, as Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Your eternal life, you'll live forever once you're born, either with God in heaven or without. But to come to know him as your personal Savior and Lord, where he writes your name in the Lamb's book of life, where when you pass from this earth, you will be in the presence of him forevermore. That's being saved. Saved from hell, saved from darkness, saved from sin, and set free. Evangelism. Of all the things that we in a church are called to do, are you listening? We're prone to wander the quickest from evangelism. We'll do everything else first. And you think, Lance and I were talking about this this morning. Lance told me when he got saved, he wanted to tell the world. Amen, brother, and amen. I told him when I got saved, I got saved on a Sunday night, got in the car to drive home with my parents, and told them I couldn't wait to get to school the next day to tell all my friends what God had done for me. When I was a young Christian, nobody had to tell me to go tell others about Jesus. It bore fruit from my heart. So what's changed, Christian? We've gotten busy doing other things. God's called us, go make disciples. Tell them. By the way, let's talk about the fourth thing that he asked us to do. Hold on, the first one is to love God. Y'all point up. The second one is to be at peace with others. That's love others. We may come close together. When I was a kid, this was peace, but y'all know what that meant? Does anybody remember those things? Or was it just in Dalton, Georgia? That meant love. Y'all don't, none of y'all had worn out jeans and long hair. <laughs> Amen. We were the love generation. I was a kid and I didn't know what that meant, but I was a love generation. <laughs> Amen. Did anybody else get this other than us? Well, for, well, I got Steve, I got one convert. Well, for, for New Holland, let's remember, the third thing we're supposed to do is tell others. Love them like Christ loved you. Tell them the good news. That's our third thing we're supposed to do. The fourth thing, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is something that God did, uh, told us to do. We're supposed to join him. We do it publicly but in front of others. It is the, our public profession of faith. It is joining in with God. It is fellowshipping together with God's people. Being a part of his church. I've often wondered why a person would say, 
I love God. I want to be a part of the church, but I'll never want to be baptized. Well, part of what we do, you know, we, is we join together. Fellowship is one of the points of the church. There are times we can do that very well. We can fellowship well. But there's times that we don't fellowship well. Matter of fact, can I just be honest? I should since I'm standing up here. Amen. We isolate more than any generation before us. Any generation. All the generations before us, family was a big deal, getting together with family, extended family. We still do that to a certain extent. But we had, we had our friends that we did things with. How many of us now come home and there's not too many people that we invite into our homes anymore? There's not too many people come over and eat together anymore. As a matter of fact, some of you have been very kind to me. And, and Lord, i got so many cards to go eat out. Lynn and I are going to eat out till March on all the cards that y'all gave us for Christmas. And we, we thank you for those things. But, you know, I was a preacher's kid growing up, and we went to somebody's house every week. We don't do that anymore. By the way, that's not me being coy about getting an invitation for lunch either. <laughs> But when was the last time you had friends over? It's like we go fellowship and then leave. We fellowship in the aisles of the church, and then we go get in our car and we go home, and we don't talk to anybody else except that little small group for a week. And we all have a little small group, but yet we're part of the body of Christ. People ask me all the time, why is the church not doing more? Because we're doing it singularly rather than together. We are the body of Christ, and we need to act like it. In my heart, I have four quadrants in my heart. The four quadrants, we do, they work together, and they bring those things together. We need to be baptizing. He said, teaching them to obey. That's discipleship. We need to carry it to the next generation. We need to mentor. We need to do things together. When the Bible says that we are to know Christ, it means to experientially know. So we not only just separate off, but we, we do things together. When Jesus sent out his disciples, why did he send them out two by two? Because there are things that they need to do together. There are things times when we need to be with an older Christian and putting an older Christian and a younger Christian together so we can learn from the strength and the wisdom. By the way, and the mistakes. And I got the scars to prove it. And why can't we pass that wisdom along and disciple? I love small groups. I don't care what you call them. I, we meet together on Sunday morning. Our church has, has Sunday school. That's extremely valuable. And we need to be in a small group doing life together. Any group, we need to do life together. Sheila began a group this past Wednesday night uh, trying to help others who may be in need where they can get together in a small group and talk about those things. And we can take the Word of God and apply it to our life. And we're going to do others, some for those who may need to learn about finances. So we'll get those group of people together and let them talk about what the Word of God says about finances. Some who have addiction issues or have uh, no other people that are in, have addiction issues. And we'll get those people together and, and we'll let them start studying what God's Word says about those things. And we can be accountable. We're going to, we're going to fellowship together and disciple together at the same time. We're going to do life together. He didn't send us out singularly. He sent us out together. So what are the five dimensions of a growing church? Churches grow warmer through fellowship. Churches grow deeper through discipleship. Churches grow stronger through worship. 
Churches grow broader through ministry, service to others. And churches grow larger through evangelism. Here's the thing. I'm going to say this in closing. God's purposes for you individually are the same purposes for the church collectively. So worship helps you focus on God. And we'll start that next week. Fellowship helps you face life's problems together. Discipleship helps fortify your faith. Ministry helps you take all the gifts and talents that God's given you and help others be better because of it. And evangelism helps fulfill your ministry. So what are we supposed to do? Love God. Love others. We're supposed to remember, love God, love others. The three crosses, the three fingers of evangelism. The four dis- quadrants of our heart, discipleship. Five, to take the hand and lend it to someone else. Give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. Y'all know I have a warped sense of humor, amen? I do, I know. I can confess it. I thought to myself, how can I get the entire church to start focusing on our five core values? Loving God, worship, loving others, ministry, or evangelism, discipleship, fellowship. How can we do that? Stand up, Rick. I'm going to get, Rick's going to start sitting in the back. (laughs) We're going to call him our high five. All right, let's see if we can do this together. Y'all look at somebody. Y'all look at somebody. Raise your hand. Go ahead. Almost sounds like we're clapping, don't it? So what I'm actually hoping to do is I'm going to walk into church and I'm going to see all these people high-fiving. <laughs> I've been to sporting events where somebody would score a touchdown or make a basket and the next thing you know, people who don't even know somebody's up there high-fiving them. Amen? We're going to make much of God's mission. We're not going to change anything, but we're going to go back to doing what we're supposed to be doing. In Psalms 11, it said, if the foundations are destroyed, listen to me now, Psalms 11 says, if the foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? That's the condition of a lot of churches today. The righteous don't know what to do because the foundations have been destroyed. We're going to get back to doing what God called us to do anyway. The Great Commission and the Great Commandment. Every decision the church makes needs to be based on our high five. What we do, what we say, where we go, how we build, everything that we do as a church needs to be based on our high five. And I'm going to ask you all to do some strange things. I know it. I'm going to ask you to walk with me and take a great big leap of faith. And collectively together... God's going to take us to a place we've never been before or we're going to hear the biggest splat in the history of Northeast Georgia. But if we splat, we're going to do it in Jesus' name. We're going to do it with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Are you all good with that? And we're going to do it collectively together. You see, I believe that God wants to bless the audacious prayers of his saints. So I don't mind asking you to get out of your comfort zone. Jesus did it all the time. And as they did, their heart was warmed. And lives were changed. Do you ever realize Jesus began with 12? And one of those betrayed him. I know they added Matthew Slater, but 
12 people rocked the world. 12. God in them, not seeing barriers, but seeing opportunities. Everything that we say, everything that we do, needs to be for the glory of God. God alone. God alone. By the way, if you don't know that God, you need to accept him. You need to repent of your sins that are separating you from God. Don't let anything get in the way of a relationship with God. All you have to do is believe in Jesus, what he did for you on the cross of Calvary. Come get honest with him. Ask him to forgive you. Repent of your sins. My goodness, don't we need to repent? I've been a Christian 47 years. I'm still repenting. I don't know how much time God's going to give me, but I have a feeling I'm going to be repenting until I see him face to face. Ask him to come into your heart and life and to change your All your life, give to him. Oh, what God can do. Does that sound like something very hard? No, it's not hard. It's very easy. It's very profound. But church, it's necessary. May we be about his business. If you don't know Christ as your Savior today, what's standing between you and a loving God who wants to save you? Get it out of the way. Come and receive Christ. Our Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are, for what you've done. For Lord, what you're going to do. Father, it comes a, it's a time in our church where it, it's time for decisions. We've heard the word of God preached, and now we're going to have to decide what we're going to do about it. And I pray that our heart is open to you and to you alone. Father, for those that are in this building today, and they've been hearing you call their name, and they've never asked you to save them. They've never truly repented. And they know what they need to do. Father, would you just call their name once again? Even in this moment, let them know that it is you that is speaking. And if they would just repent and believe and confess their sins and ask you to save them, Lord, you would. You're that kind of God. If you did it for me, you do it for anyone. Lord, may they pray even now and mean it in their heart and let you change them. But Lord, for those of us that are Christians, and some of us have been Christians for quite a while, but we're not, we haven't been doing what you called us to do. And if you ask us why, Lord, we probably don't have a good answer. Lord, help us to get back to the foundation of doing what you called us to do. Lord, if the foundation is destroyed, what are we going to do? Lord, we need to make sure that our house is built on the rock, the solid rock of Christ. Father, hear our prayers. Catch us as we take this leap of faith. Lord, bless New Holland Baptist Church as we seek to do your will. May you and you alone get all the glory. Father, receive this invitation. Do with it whatever you please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.